Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, I wasn't obviously to, you know, prepare to share today, um, <clears throat> but um, God knew, <laughs> God knows, and um, I believe He has a, a word for us, and um, as Brother Sam phoned me last night, and we spoke about, you know, what we possibly might bring, and I went and I, I really spent some time with the Lord, and um, I was praying, and then suddenly um, I met with the Lord, and there was just this uh, word that He constantly was pressing on my heart, and it was prayer, prayer. And um, one of the big burdens that I've had for quite a number of, of months in our midst is um, we don't pray like we used to. There isn't that spirit of prayer that I've, I, I know and I've tasted in our midst as, as a church. And um, God said to me that He wants to change that. Yeah. And it's just this morning, that it was just amazing that I can immediately see there was, there was a desperation in some of the brothers and sisters' prayer. There was a cry out, there was a call and... And I can just see God is already saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to make this church a church that prays again. I'm going to rise the spirit of prayer in our midst. And I am excited about that because that's a work of the Lord that He is going to do. And so last night, <clears throat> there, uh, prayer is such a big subject. There's just so many things that we can meditate upon the Scriptures. But God wants to take us through the disciples' prayer this morning. And I want to talk to you about a people that prays and a people that God will have in these last days. A praying people. A people who know how to pray. A people that knows that without praying, they cannot continue in their walk. There's no, there will be no growth. They, they cannot go on with Jesus. They will not be able to overcome out there. They need to be a people that seek the face of God. Not just as a, in, in here on Sunday, but at home in their secret place. Prayer is something that we, 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 we need to come back to as a church. I believe this is a prophetic word. I believe God is speaking to us this morning as a church. We need to pray, brothers and sisters. God wants to have a people that pray in these last days. A praying people. A people who seek the face of God. And I want to walk through just, just some, it probably won't be long. I don't know, I always say that and then it ends up, you know, the Lord speaks. But I, and I, then I want us to go before the Lord as a church. That's, that's why also I, I want us to have time and I want us to seek the Lord together. And I believe God wants to do a work. I want to give the chance for the Holy Spirit to move upon our hearts and stir us and give us a hunger and thirst to cry out to God this morning because we need the Lord. We need His Holy Spirit. Amen. So I want to speak to you about this prayer that, that, Jesus, that Jesus asks, that Jesus teaches the, the, the disciples. You know, it's amazing already. We've had these prayers in our midst this morning. If you went here, uh, you know, Brother Sam already prayed uh, as we were praying, Lord, teach us how to pray. There was this, all, this, this word was just being confirmed and confirmed over and over again. And so, <clears throat> this morning, my heart is, Jesus, we're coming to you, Lord. Teach us how to pray, Lord. Make us people who pray. <laughs> we need to pray, brothers and sisters. Not just say these words, but it is so important. And I pray that God would open our eyes to see that this morning in a way that will ask for, demand the response from the people of God. Not just an intellectual assent. Yes, prayer is important. But I'm going to show you, I pray that the Holy Spirit will show you how important prayer is. Prayer is a way of life. Prayer is something to be always practiced in our hearts in the new covenant. Prayer is the life of a Christian. The life of a Christian is prayer. We are told... <clears throat> In verse 9, <clears throat> this is the first thing. Let us read this. Our Father, in our Father 
in heaven, or our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven. The first thing that I want to press on our hearts and that God was speaking to my heart last night about prayer that we need to understand. The first thing that Jesus and the disciples are coming, they, you know, they, they want to learn and Jesus is going to teach them. And the first thing that He says to them is, this is how you ought to pray. The first thing you say is, Our Father in heaven. In other words, prayer is fundamentally based upon relationship. This is not a God that is far off. This is a God whom I am in relationship with. This is my Father. This is my Father. This is a, this is a relationship that, 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 that prayer is, is, is started and founded on a relationship. And if you're going to grow in God, and if we're going to grow as a church, it will mean that we have to grow in prayer. Prayer is relationship. Prayer is it is knowing that God is my Father and I have a Father in heaven. So much of, of, of the church needs to, needs to have a fresh revelation of this this morning. That, hey, I, I have a Father in heaven. I am not far off. I am not someone who, who, who worships a God that, that is unknown. But because I willingly received Him, as John said, I've become children of the living God. I have a Father that I can call upon. I come to the Lord not because I know special things, not because I am great, not because I am poor, not because of anything, but because I am in a relationship with God. I know Him. He's my Father in heaven. A relationship. That's the, the foundation of prayer. And if you're desiring a relationship with God, an intimate relationship with God, the people of God will pray. The church will pray. Lord, we want to know You more. Lord, we want to grow in relationship with You. And because we have that desire, and because that, that initiates a prayer desire in the people of God. Lord, You're my Father. I have a Father in heaven. Praise the Lord. Amen. That means, brothers and sisters, you look at how little prayer. Think about it, brothers. Let's be honest. I have seen, I'll be the one that confessed the first this morning, that I have seen, I've been very busy, and I've so easily seen that my prayer time has, has fallen, that, that the desire to seek the Lord has, even for, I, I, I can see that in my life. And if a relationship is important for you, you, you can so easily see, you know, one of the things that lacks the most in the church is prayer. And what does that say? If prayer is founded on a relationship, what does that say? Where is the relationship with the Lord? Where is the relationship with our Heavenly Father? We, we need to be people of praying. If we desire a living, active relationship with the Lord, we would go to Him. We would be a praying people. His house is a house of prayer. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, I hope we can see that this morning. You know, it, it is something I, I remember. I was in seminary and we, we, we were, the subject was the Gospel of Matthew. And there was a whole lecture on this, on this um, prayer. And, you know, I was stunned what the le you know, lecturer said. He, you know, he, he, he reads as Jesus goes before this prayer and, and, and Jesus says, that, you know, do not pray like the pagans do, for they use empty phrases and, and, and you know, many words. And, and then he went on to say that, you know, you can, you can say the, the Lord's Prayer in about 15, 20 seconds, so you don't have to pray a lot. Jesus taught us to pray 20 seconds or 30 seconds, and you're missing the whole point. This is not what it's about. It's, not, it's about a relationship with God. It's about a relationship with with the Lord. This is the counter. You see, before that he says that the Gentiles pray empty phrases, empty words, mindless babble. Why? Because they don't have a relationship even with their false deities, even with their false gods. They don't have a living relationship. Therefore they can babble. Don't believe all this new age stuff in the church about meditating without you know, just words and stuff and new age. There's, that's no, there's no relationship in that. 
and the prayer and the Bible and men and God and women and God and seeking God is because there's a relationship. That is what initiates and ignites prayer. I know my God. I know I have a Father in heaven and I'm going to go to Him. Do we hear that this morning? Praise the Lord. And here I want to show something. <clears throat> After there is an acknowledgement that I am, I am praying, I, I have this relationship with God. This is, a, this is, this is the disciples' prayer. This is, a, this is a prayer of a disciple. This is a people who pray. It's hallowed be thy name. You'll see this right throughout the Bible. I'm going to give you examples of this. After there is this acknowledgement of a relationship, a desire for a relationship, the people of God has an acknowledgement, almost a revelation of who God is. Always. I'm going to show this to you. There is always, when they start praying, there is a recognize, they recognize that we are in a, in a special relationship with God, whether it was Israel, whether it was the church. There is a special relationship. That's the acknowledgement of Father, of, of my God. My, it's always my God, my King. I, I'm in this relationship. But after that, there is, Lord, you are great. And we'll see that. I want to show you some, some examples of this. Um, I'm going to give us four examples, but there's just so many of them. <clears throat> Let us turn to the book of Acts, chapter 4. <coughs> verse, verse 24. And when they heard it, this is now the, 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 the early church praying, and when they heard it, they lifted their, uh, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign, listen to this, Sovereign Lord. Listen to how the Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in it. You see that? An acknowledgement of, of who God is, a, a, a cry to God and say to the Lord, Lord, you are set apart. You are nothing like us. You are great. David had the similar prayer. Turn with me to um, 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Verse 10 and 11. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 10 and 11. Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of, in, in the presence of all the assembly. David, David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father. Look at that. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Notice he acknowledges this relationship. And now look, look at this. Look at how, how he, he speaks about the Lord. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory. Hallelujah. And the majesty and all the things in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as the head above all. Do you see that, brothers and sisters? There is when there's a prayer, there is an acknowledgement of my relationship with God, and then there is this, this cry out of who God is. There's this worship of God. There is this acknowledgement, oh God, you are great. And I tell you, a key characteristic of a praying people 
is a people who has this fresh awareness and knowing of the greatness of God. It's alive in their hearts. It's burning in their hearts. They know that God is great. They know that God is glorious. And it is living in, the, in, in their lives. A people who pray has this reality alive in their hearts. How did Jesus pray? Turn with me to Matthew 11. Matthew 11 verse 25. And at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and have revealed them unto little children. My Father, and I acknowledge that you are the Lord of the heaven and earth. Hallelujah. Do you see this this morning? One more example of Jesus. Mark 14. Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. Verse 36. And he, say, and he said, that is Jesus, Abba, Father. Listen to this. Listen to this small phrase. Abba, Father. All things are possible for you. Do you see that? All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. There is this relationship and then there is this acknowledgement of who God is. Brothers and sisters, if we are not a praying people, if we are not a praying church, we will lose who God is. So much of the church, I tell you, one of the reasons why they have forgotten God, they don't know God, is they don't pray. In prayer you come to know God intimately. You see Him with the eyes of your heart. You know the greatness of God. Pray, I pray that the Lord would do such thing corporately this morning. And that there would be such reality that comes. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They continually devoted themselves to those four things, the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And it says in verse 43, directly afterwards, and all reverence, fear, fell upon every soul. And great wonders were done through the apostles. Why? Because there was a reality in their midst. They had a revelation of who God is more than what any church I think has ever done before. God was real. We spoke last night, you know, Brother Sam, you know, he said, you know, we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and he said, we need to really understand, we just need to meditate. You know, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're the temple of God. God lives inside of you. Do you hear that this morning? You know, I, I think about how false religion, you know, how, how there's a reverence and a fear of their idol in their temple. But God is here this morning. There's a, we need to hear that this morning. He's living inside of you. Oh, that God will open our eyes this morning. And that all that fell upon every soul, that reality that, whoa, the creator of the heavens and earth is in our midst. He is in our midst. 
I tell you, that reality comes when there's a dedication to prayer, when there's a dedication in seeking the face of God, wanting to know Him more, not just here, but at home. That is when reality comes, when we stop praying, the light starts to dim. We need to pray. This is only two verses already. But can you hear the Lord this morning? God stir a new work of prayer in our midst. Jesus proceeds then. And he... Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done as it is in heaven, so be it on earth. Do you see that this is a prayer for reality? Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. As it is in heaven, so be it on earth. It is an invitation to God to say, Lord, I know in the heaven, in the heavens, there where your throne is, I have been given a glimpse in different parts of your word. The book of Revelation chapter 4 and 5, best pictures this. There is such reality there, there where everything is centered around you. And I want that reality to come in my heart. Lord, there is nothing else. That's what this prayer means. Bring that reality in heaven and bring it in my heart. Because I'm not there's nothing else on this earth that will get me there. I'm not praying, Lord, get me to that church. Get that church's reality in me. I'm not praying, Lord, that, that brother's reality in me. I'm asking, Lord, for what is in heaven to come down and let it be real in my heart, in my life. This is a, this is a cry in God's people. That, Lord, I want that kingdom in my heart. I want your will in my heart. This is a prayer to so much of our prayers is, Lord, is trying to ask God, God, you align with my will. Lord, come here. Lord, help here. Lord, uphold there. But this is, this is, this is, this is the disciples' prayer. Before there's anything, any needs, everything, Lord, I want to align myself with you. I'm not concerned about you following me. I'm concerned about me following you. I'm not concerned that you understand just my circumstances. I want to live in your reality. I want to be there, Lord. And the people who pray have this richly dwelling in their hearts. A church that prays has the kingdom of God uh, expressed, manifesting in their midst. A reality. What are some of these things? Well, one of the first things when I read the book of Revelation and I see the reality that is in heaven, I have this awe and I see this power of God. God is awesome. He is so powerful. It's just that there's a reverence, there's, a, there's this power. And so when, when I pray, Lord, have Bring this kingdom. You know, I, I, there's, a, there's a sense here that I am asking, Lord, that, that, that power that is there, that, that doesn't allow any evil, that has overcome death, that, has, that, that there is just purity there, that, that demonstration of your holiness, that power there. I want that in my life. I want it there. A praying people asks for the power of God. A praying people that always pray is a powerful people. They want that demonstration of the kingdom of God in their lives. They're not concerned with the power of man. Lord, we, we, not, we don't want the government to intervene. We don't, we're not looking for you know, that person's wealth. We're not looking towards money. We're not looking towards our organizational skills. 
Lord, we need your kingdom to come. We need your power to manifest in our midst. Please, Lord, bring that kingdom. Bring your will, Lord. Bring that power. That power where Jesus commands sickness to go away. That power, Lord, that every time evil is trying to confront Jesus, it gets obliterated. Every time sickness tries to confront Jesus, it gets obliterated. That power, bring it, Lord. Bring it in our midst. We're not interested in power of man. We don't want power of man. We want the power of God. And the people who pray, they, are, they have the power of God. That's a people who. That, that's a characteristic of someone who prays a lot. He has this power. Jesus works through him. I shared yesterday with my father-in-law and, and, and brother Leo. You know, one of the big ways that the early church evangelized or um, what was sort of the apologetics of the early church? What was their defense for the faith? What was their argument to believe in Jesus? What, what, what did they say? Uh, they, they used numerous things, but one thing that you'll find all, everyone uses and is sort of their center, <coughs> center argument to, to the world is they say to the pagans, Look at the church. Look at the power of God in our midst. Look at the people in the church. Look at how He heals sicknesses. Look how He heals diseases. Look how He has changed these wicked men into upright men who fear God and who obey the law. They point to the power in the church. And nobody could refute that. Nobody. And they constantly almost mock the pagans and their idols. And they say, Jesus is crushing your idols every single day. Come to Jesus and bow and worship Him. More and more your idols will fall at the feet of Jesus. You call him a dead man? Hmm. He's alive. And your idols are running away from the supposedly dead man. Your demons are crying out out of fear as of the supposedly dead man. No, the early church says, I assure you, he's alive. And you want to know where to look? Look in my life. Look in the church's life. Where is that? You know, I want Brother Ben and Brother Tyler and all of us be able to say that. To say, you know, if you come and you see Jesus is alive. There was a, there was a reality. The church didn't know of, you know, to fight Science with science and, you know, to fight philosophy with philosophy. They, they did that. But when they really wanted to press the point home, look at the church. Jesus is alive. Deal with it. Praise the Lord. Do we want that this morning? That happens to a church that prays. A praying people. Lord, I want that power to be in our midst. Holiness, I, I mentioned holiness. Again, there is this cry in the, constantly in the people of God who pray, who wants His kingdom to come, who wants His will to be done. Again, they recognize, Lord, there's no righteousness on earth that I want. There's no righteousness on earth. I want the righteousness in heaven. I want that kingdom righteousness. Remember Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God and its righteousness first. Seek, seek that first. Seek that. I want the righteousness in heaven. I want to be clothed with your righteousness. You see, a people who pray cannot be self-righteous. Because they are constantly in the presence of God and they are aware and they have a desire to have the righteousness from heaven. 
They want God's holiness. They don't want some fake hypocrisy, some facade, something they dress every Sunday with. They want the righteousness in heaven. They want the light of God to dwell in their hearts. It's the Lord. What else? Unity. Jesus himself said, a kingdom of God cannot be divided. I tell you, the most united kingdom ever, a kingdom that cannot be divided for sure, is his. Is that kingdom that is on its way and it manifests in our hearts and in this church. Brothers and sisters, when you're a disciple, I pray that there is such a desire to ask the Lord when you look up into that heavenly vision in Revelation, it's all summed up and you just see, wow, what unity. It says that I heard a voice of a multitude of angels. One voice, multitude of angels. Your brother Sam spoke about the glory that God shares with us in unity. There is a prayer in the disciples' heart, it is a, there's a prayer that the, the, the praying people have that that kingdom unity would manifest. And I tell you, a church that prays is also a church that's united. God would do a work of bringing us together. Look at in Acts. What happened? There was praying, there was fasting, and they were seeking God together, and then the Holy Spirit came. There was a unity. And the prayer brings people together. Prayer, God can unite people in prayer. God can do a work of unity in prayer. And my cry is today that, look, we need, we need to cry out, Lord, that unity in heaven, I want that in my marriage. Lord, I need that in my marriage. Lord, I need to be united with my wife. I need to be united with my husband. Lord, I need that unity. That unity I see there, I don't want any earth unity. No, no uh, counseling. No, no, nothing's going to achieve that. I need that reality of unity in my heart. Bring your kingdom, Lord. Bring your will. Let my marriage be, Lord, can it, that, that it be so united that nothing can separate it. Lord, I, Lord uh, that my family, Lord. I need unity in my family, Father God. Lord, that unity I see again, bring that in my family. Fathers, I pray. Lord, I pray you speak to the fathers here this morning. We need to stand up. We need to take our wives and pray with them. Amen. We need to take them and say, Lord, I'm going to, Lord, we, we, we were going to go together as a, married, as a married couple before you, as a couple you've joined. And Lord, we're going to pray, Lord, bring that unity. Bring us closer together. Make us, Lord, re realize this oneness that you have done. Lord, fathers, listen. My family, I'm going to take them. I'm going to, Lord, I'm, uh, we need unity in my family, Lord. Satan is constantly active trying to take my children, trying to, Lord, teach my children all kinds of rubbish and foolishness from the world. We need the unity of the Holy Spirit. Lord, fathers, you need to rely on the Lord. You need to be prayerful, man. I have neglected this in the last couple of weeks, and I pray this first to, you know, preach this first to myself, but we need it. Fathers, today, the Lord is calling you. Be the priest of your house. Take your wife and pray. Take your family and pray. Ask for the Lord. Lord, bring that unity. Lord, we need to be united. Gather us as a hand. You gather that hand under your, uh, the, the chicks under your, your wing. Lord, please, gather us. And fathers, let us take leading. This is what the Lord asks for us of us. It tells us <clears throat> in Romans 14, verse 17, that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy. In the Holy Spirit. Joy. A praying people. Lord, the kingdom, the, the, the reality there, I want a burning joy in my heart. I tell you what, a people and a church 
that labors in prayer will have an enormous amount of joy in their hearts. Because when you know, when you have that reality of who God is and you have a fresh encounter with Jesus, you just are aware of all that He has done for you. You know you're secure in Christ. You know, you just know that what the Lord has done for you and there is just a leaping of joy in your heart. There's always a singing, there's, but if there's a grumbling, if there's taking our eyes of Christ and there's dropping our heads, there needs to be a joy in the house of the Lord. Part of why prayer is not in the church, you know, what's replacing prayer is entertainment, because entertainment has, you know, a false a false substitute for, for joy, to make people feel good, to clap their hands. But if people can come into the house of God, having sat at His feet, having seen how great He is, having seen how awesome He is, and then come and start crying and praising God, we don't need any entertainment. You'll see the joy of the Lord moving through this place, melting people's hearts. The joy of the Lord. Why is there so much fear in the people of God and not peace? Because people don't pray. You can't scare a man and a woman that prays always. You can't scare them. I pray that the Lord this morning will do such a work in us that that boldness would come. You see the early church? They prayed for this. Said, Lord, give us boldness. We don't ask, Lord, to run away now. But we are asking, Father God, for boldness, Lord. We want that this peace that surpasses all understanding come what may. I am on the rock. I know my God. I know His promises. I know He, he will do what He said. I have peace. This is what Jesus, you know, in, in John chapter 20 from verse 19 on, the, the, the disciples are on the upper room and they, it says they're afraid of the Jews. And it then says Jesus appears in their midst and His first word says, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. No anxiety in the house of God. If you're struggling with anxiety, pray. Pray to the Lord. I really hunger for this reality of the kingdom of God manifesting in our midst. There's so much more that, that we can say, but I want that. Do you want that? I want God to start that in us. Give us today our daily bread. You know, I, I know some of us have, you know, I've done this before, we... Because we don't really know this, in the sense that we don't really rely on God for our daily bread. You know, we, we feel like it's, it's, we just have so much. So we, we've taken this verse often and we talk about, you know, the, the, the manna, you know, the word of God. Because at least that's something we can feel like more that we can depend on. Um, and that's good. But this morning, I want you to have a fresh revelation that God is your provider. And the people who pray are intimately aware that God is my provider and that every good gift comes from Him. But notice, Lord, give me my daily bread after asking for this kingdom, after asking for this will to manifest, he asks, Lord, the Lord Jesus teaches us to ask for our daily bread. Do you see that he's not saying more than what we need? Ask for what you need. So much of the carnal things we pray, is it things that we want or is it things that we need? Jesus himself even said, I, I, I believe that the Lord 
is weary by the people of God's prayers when it comes to, Lord, I want a new house, I want a new car, I want this, I want that, above the things we need. God already said in the previous chapter, seek the kingdom of God first. For your heavenly Father already knows what you need in terms of clothes, in terms of food. The way that Jesus teaches the people of God in our prayer time is not to overload God with all of our carnal needs that so much of the church is doing, but ask the Lord for our simple needs. The need that I need for every day to serve you, to praise you. I don't need anything more because I'm passing through this kingdom. I want your kingdom. The things of this kingdom is just to sustain me because I'm just here and I'm passing through. I am a pilgrim. How much of the prayer of the church today is about things of this kingdom? Look at the two kingdoms. They are, trans, they are, they are compared with you this, this, for you this morning. Pray for the fullness of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the earthly kingdom, pray what you need. Do we hear that this morning? Amen. Just pray what you need for. I wish that God would do that, a fresh desire in us that I see, I can see that every brother and sister in this fellowship, in every area of their life, I can see they're seeking the kingdom of God first. They are aligning their work. They are aligning their finances. They're aligning <clears throat> their relationships. They're aligning their time. Everything to see the kingdom of God come in their lives. How much of our life is just, do you, there's not much here about the earth. Again. Just pray for what you need and know even your heavenly Father knows what you need and He will look after you. But this is not the focus. I pray that our prayers will not center around what we want. What, 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 what we need in terms of this earthly kingdom. And that our rather, our desire, our hearts is positioned to know this kingdom of God that Jesus has brought. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. A people that pray is intimately aware that they need the mercy of God. Every day. A people that pray is intimately aware that they need the mercy of God. And they're also aware that this mercy depends on how I am merciful to others. Blessed are those who, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. A people of God who pray is intimately aware that they need the mercy of God. I think it was Leonard Ravenhill who said this. People who live in sin does not want to pray. Self-righteous people cannot pray. And when we praying with the, when we in this time in this communion with the Lord, we are intimately God will, will, will work in our hearts and we will see, we see His greatness. We, we, we see who we are and we realize that we need the mercy of God every day. There is a dependence on Him. We need You, Lord. I cannot go a day without Your mercy. I stand because of Your mercy. I need You, Lord. And out of that, our relationship goes towards others as well. Because I know that I need God, therefore that will impact me of how I treat others. A praying people will have the true mercy of God in their midst. There is a false mercy in the church today. A mercy where you are accepted in your sin not to change, not to pursue God. You never be to be confronted. That's not the mercy of God. The mercy of God is that He confronts you. 
The mercy of God is that He comes and stands in front of you when you're walking on the way off the cliff. He comes and He says, My child, what are you doing? Turn around. And if a praying people will exhibit that mercy of God, will exhibit that heart of God to the lost people, will come and say, Lord, hear the mercy of the Lord. He is reaching out to you today. He will not just turn a blind eye and let you walk away from Him, but He's going to stretch out His arm towards you today. Bring that reality on us. These things come when we pray. This is the prayer life of a disciple. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Lead me not into temptation. A people who pray know that they're not strong of themselves. We look at it, I mean, Jesus taught clearly we, we are overcomers. Every temptation that comes, there's grace. Can I get a hallelujah? Praise the Lord. Every temptation, there's grace. In other words, if you fell to it, it's not God's fault. However, in a praying people, there is this acknowledgement, Lord, I, 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 I'm weak. I am not strong. Please, keep me, protect me. One of the things that Jesus had to, he had to work with his disciples for three years to break this in them was their confidence in themselves. Peter had to, had to learn this. The disciples had to learn this. Lord, I, I, I can, I, I'll never deny you. Oh, well, Lord, I will also never deny you. Constantly, God needed to show the disciples that, listen to me, you are weak. You can't do anything without me. You need to trust me. You need to rely upon me. You need to be dependent solely upon me. And one of the first things, and I don't care what, what you know, you can say, well, that's not my intention. If you don't pray, you are saying I'm strong. Because if you were really aware of your need, you will go and say, Lord, I need you. I need you today. I need you again. Please, Lord, keep me with you. Hold me close. Don't let me stray. Don't, Lord, even, there's just no temptation. Lord, I, I, I need you. A people that pray is always humble and have no confidence in themselves. And that is why God can use a people of praise so much. So much. And when there is an acknowledgement of this, but deliver me from evil, a people who pray know that there is no other deliverance, there is no other help, there is no other salvation, there is no one else to go to but to God. I'm not going to run first to here or there. A people who has a prayer life, I tell you what, they know that God is a Savior. A church that prays knows that God is a Savior and a Deliverer. That He is mighty to save. And when they do, they can proclaim Him. They know He's a Savior. If we don't pray, we don't have these things. This is a disciple's prayer life. This is to be perpetually burning in your heart. There has to be this desire in our midst. And I believe God wants to start that today. Amen.
revive the work of prayer in our midst.